And um, I just want to thank all of you for having me out. We, I actually came from upstate New York, so we had to fly to Dallas, and then I flew up here uh, last night. And uh, it just I had a great night's sleep, and um, it, just great accommodations. And so I'm, I'm pumped about what I'm going to share with you this morning. Or See, I'm used to saying that on a Sunday morning. It's afternoon, Saturday afternoon. And, and by the way, all of you coming out on Saturday afternoon, uh, thank you for your commitment to the church, to the Lord, to his word. Um, there's a lot of other things you could be doing on a Saturday afternoon, and so um, I'm just really appreciative of that. Uh, I want to talk to you today about a problem that is not just in the church, it's in the world, it's all around us, really. It's just in about every institution, uh, and that's social justice. It's in, um, really, the Boy Scouts, our knitting clubs, it's in sports. It's, it, anywhere you look, it seems like uh, there's a social justice message that you're hearing. And I think a lot of the messaging that we've heard in the last three years is new. It, it kind of came out of nowhere uh, for someone who's perhaps just living their life, going to church, keeping a job, and, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it was the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter and LGBT uh, normalization and, um, and even some of the COVID stuff, to be honest with you, uh, fits into this. And, and so I'm going to talk about all that. I'm going to talk about why this is a threat to the gospel and also just our Christian theology and how it's making its way uh, into the church. And it, this is a serious topic. This isn't just my opinion. This is, uh, th- this is something that we can open the pages of Scripture. We can look at what's being said today in popular media and in academia, and we can look at what the scripture says, and we can see the two are not congruent, that there's actually contradictions. And, and so I categorize the social justice movement in the, um, in, in the category of false teaching. That's, that's what we're facing. And so I think it's a very serious thing. It's a sobering thing, but we know that our Lord is powerful. He is at work. He is sovereign. He is going to win. Uh, he, he does win at the end, and, and we win as Christians. And so there's also some encouragement here that the Lord has not left us without a witness. He's given us his word, and that's all we need to be able to understand and navigate this issue. So, um, so th- once again, thank you for coming out, and uh, let's just open with a word of prayer. Can we do that? Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the truth that you've given us, Lord, in a world that is, frankly, confused doesn't know up from down, doesn't know right from wrong, and Lord, you've given us clarity and direction, and Father, we are so thankful for that. Uh, Father, I pray for everyone in this room, Lord, that you would uh, work on their hearts and on mine. I pray you'd help me to communicate clearly, and that we would understand the threat that is before us, and that we would be able to meet it, Lord, uh, in this power and strength. Uh, that you can only bring. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, I want to give you a definition of social justice and then unpack the social justice movement's history a little bit and then get into uh, the theology that, and philosophy that social justice advocates and why that's different than what we believe as Christians. So here's my definition for social justice. The modern social justice movement is a repackaged configuration of egalitarian ideas heavily influenced over the past century by postmodern and Marxist derivatives. Its purpose is to rectify disparities and advantages between social groups through reallocation. Thanks, John. We all understand now what the social justice movement is, right? It was clear as mud. Uh, I, I'm going to return to this definition after giving you some history, and I think it'll make sense. So I do need to acknowledge there are people who have used the term social justice. Uh, There's not many of them, but there are a few throughout history who've used this term, and they don't mean what we're going to be talking about today. They're not talking about quite the same thing. Uh, The social justice tradition that I am talking about, you could call redistributive justice. Um, Some people might call it socialism, but it's really, it's even broader than that. i want to start with an, a gentleman by the name of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau was a philosopher of the French Revolution. And Rousseau wanted, essentially, there, there were three teachings that, that Rousseau believed in that have marked every iteration of social justice. So I don't care if you're talking about uh, just Fabian socialism or progressivism, uh, Marxism of various stripes, if you're talking about uh, 
social or, or um, uh, neo-Marxism and cultural Marxism or critical theory or the Black Lives Matter movement and, and some of the things we see today, you're going to see these three elements in every single iteration of social justice. Here's the first one. The goal of achieving an egalitarian ideal. Now, what's egalitarianism mean? Today, we use the term equity, inclusion, and diversity. Okay, Same thing. Egalitarianism is, is the French word for equal, and that was the spirit of the French Revolution, was to have uh, an egalitarian society where all the outcomes would be essentially equal. That people who came from different social locations and backgrounds and were different genders and had different parents and her hereditary differences and social class differences would all be able to be equal to one another in their economics, in their platforming, in uh, the privileges that they had, and, and that was the goal. So we got to get there somehow. That was what Rousseau believed. Achieve an egalitarian ideal. Now, the problem is that there are things preventing this from taking place. And so number two, the, the second major teaching here, is that we need to dismantle social institutions that prevent the achievement of this egalitarian utopia. So what kind of social institutions would those be? Well, families. Would, would be kind of one because you have things like inheritance that gets passed down from generation to generation and it stays within the family and it's not fair that some people are just born into that and others aren't. Uh, you have various labor relationships that exist and so there's hierarchies in labor. Some people are making decisions. Other people are doing uh, the, the hard work. Um, you have, uh, you know, in our day and age, you can point to uh, all kinds of voluntary associations uh, that, um, like, you know, at one time in our history, uh, the Masons were thought to be this. There was, they had a guild, and, and there are, have been guilds, economic guilds, and that's not fair, that uh, different groups benefit each other. And, and so th there's all these, this complex web of power relationships that exist that's preventing everything from being equal. That's, that's the main problem here. The church prevents this from taking place because in the church you have a hierarchy. You have some people at the top. You call them pastor. Uh, you give them authority over yourself. Um, and so what needed to happen to get around these barriers was a force needed to be created, a force capable of executing this utopian dream. Now, today, I don't think it will come as a surprise to you that force is the government, the national government, or now we're talking about, with the Great Reset, an international government of sorts. A force that's so big that it, it's the biggest bully that's able to go beat up all the other little bullies on the street. And I think the ironic part of this, and really one of the biggest Achilles heels of the whole social justice thinking, is that if the goal is to eliminate hierarchies, to, so everyone's equal, so there's no disparities between people, then Social justice itself creates the biggest disparity that's ever existed in human history. An impersonal, all-powerful, godlike government endowed with all kinds of resources and privileges, and then you as an individual, without any voluntary association or mediating association to protect you. So achieving an egalitarian ideal, dismantling social institutions that prevent its achievement, and implementing a force capable of executing the utopian dream. Now, I'm going to go through some, some brief history here of how this, this redistributive justice, taking from some groups, giving to others, whether that's privilege, money, however, uh, whatever the mechanism is for uh, the, the government or whatever organization that has authority to come in and make things equal. I'm going to give you a history of how this thinking has taken shape in different ways throughout time. So the most recognizable would perhaps be communism or Marxism. 1848, Karl Marx published the Communist Manifesto. And in that work, he uh, called for mechanisms to abolish bourgeois property, so the, the landed people's property, through state control of credit, transportation, and production, as well as free public education. That's actually a very new idea, free public education. Uh, we take it for granted, but that's, that's a Marxist idea. And in, in 1848, when he wrote this, there were socialist revolutions across Europe. Now, many of them failed. And many of the, the people that were involved in those actually fled their countries in Europe, and they came to places like the United States and throughout the Midwest. Uh, that's why a lot of Germans settled in the Midwest and started newspapers. 
Uh, if you trace the origins in some ways of our liberal media, that you'll start finding out some interesting connections here. But uh, they were fleeing. They came to the United States, and they brought with them their socialist ideas. And there was some rich soil in the United States at that time for these ideas. We had prohibitionism, anti-masonry, uh, abolitionism, women's emancipation. There's all these social reform movements going on. And, and it created it just a fertile ground for uh, the acceptance of socialist ideas. And so um, what ended up happening was we got the social gospel. And Walter Rauschenbusch is a Baptist professor in New York. He's most commonly credited with creating or inventing the social gospel. But there was another term that he often used. He didn't always talk about the social gospel. What he actually talked about quite a bit, if you read his writings, is his term social justice. He's the one that popularized the term. And it wasn't just him. He was probably uh, the main one. In fact, um, I can give you quotes, and there's many quotes in, at, at the book table in the back, uh, the Red Book, Christianity and Social Justice. I provide a number of quotes from socialists it, during the turn of the century in the, the United States of America who used the term social justice to promote socialism. And the reason they didn't want to use the term socialism was because it kind of has a bad rap. People hear socialism and they think, well, that's immoral and that's atheistic because that's how the socialists in Europe were. And so they introduced Fabian socialism, it's called. It's, we call it progressivism in this country. Instead of a one-time revolution, progressively getting to this utopia through the long march through the institutions, uh, step by step gradually, they took that idea, that progressivist idea, that socialist idea, and they just called it social justice because Christians in the United States would be more willing to accept it if it was called social justice instead of being called socialism. So that's really the origin of uh, the popularization of the term, and that's the tradition that we stand in when we talk about social justice today. There's a semi-Christian origin to it. Now, it's obvious these ideas aren't coming from Christianity. It's, it's people who claim to be Christians that are manipulating language in order to import these secular ideas. Well, Marx thought the problem was that some people have stuff and other people don't, and that's just not fair. So we got to take from the people who have the stuff and give to the people who don't have the stuff. That's my sophisticated rendering of communism. Cultural Marxism is a little bit different. There was a gentleman by the name of Antonio Gramsci, who was a, an Italian socialist, and he believed that the workers failed to sufficiently re revolt against the upper classes because they were controlled by the upper classes. But it wasn't through money, necessarily. It was through things like, and this is what he said, libraries, schools, voluntary associations, architecture, street names, and the church. All of these things are oppressing you, and you don't even know it. You're, you're fine with it. Uh, you live with the habits that were passed down to you from your ancestors, and they were fine with it, and so you just accept it. Uh, you, you know, street names, for instance. You know, you drive down the street, and there's the name of maybe uh, the last name of a family. And why, why does that person, why, why, do, why does a certain class of people get to have their names on streets and other people don't? Isn't that, that's not fair. How come certain books uh, that push certain narratives are in libraries and other books aren't? These are the questions he started asking. So that's where we get cultural Marxism, that it's not an economic thing. It's bigger than that. It's privilege. It's, it's, uh, it's influence. It's all these other factors. It's why the monuments are coming down in our country all over the place. Uh, we did a documentary two years ago called American Monument, and we traced a lot of this stuff. I mean, you go to a place like Portland, they've taken down almost everything. Uh, and if it's not the government, it's mobs doing it. Why? because they see oppression when they look at that. Um, same in Seattle. By the way, though, there is a statue, a big one of Vladimir Lenin in Seattle they haven't touched, which I thought was interesting. But. Now, critical theorists, this is, how many of you have heard of critical race theory in this room? Oh, we, okay, this is good, all right. So critical theorists, this is the forerunner of critical race theorists, drilled down even deeper than Antonio Gramsci. Antonio Gramsci thought there's these cultural factors that oppress and the critical theorists came along and said, yeah, well, we're going to dive deep into cultural factors. In fact, when we see that advertisement on television telling you you need the new car, that's oppression because you didn't think you needed it before, and now all of a sudden you're controlled into buying something you don't need. So you're being oppressed all over the place. And one of the examples of this was one of the members of the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School uh, invented critical theory. 
um, was a man by the name of Theodore Adorno. And, um, and, and this is taking place post-World War II. It's before, really, during, and after World War II is when uh, critical theorists were promoting their ideas and in the United States after World War II. And Theodore Adorno writes this book in 1950 called The Authoritarian Personality. And what he says is that there are traits such as submission to parental authority, a belief in traditional gender roles, family pride, homophobia, a strong devotion to Christianity, and the notion that foreign ideas posed a threat to American institutions that signaled implicit pre-fascist tendencies. Let me give you the shorthand. If you love your family and you love your country, you're a Nazi. It's basically what he's saying. That's why today, everyone to the right of Bernie Sanders is a Nazi in the eyes of the media. This was taking root in academia. Thousands, uh, th th this was actually happening uh, with thousands of psychologists and with hundreds of or, um, psychology departments across the country in the 1950s and 60s. We just didn't hear about it because it was contained in academia. Well, now we know about it because it's made its way into the street. So the, these ideas have been long in their development. Now, before we get to critical race theory, there's one other development I want to share with you, and that's radical subjectivity, sometimes called postmodernism. And postmodernism, some people separate this from Marxism. You know, you hear a lot today about when people talk about social justice, they'll say, well, it's just Marxism or it's just postmodernism or it's a combination. And I've, I've taken a little bit of a different approach. I think it's just all redistributive justice and there's different iterations of it. And, um, and, and the, the interesting thing about postmodernism is that the postmodernists themselves knew that they were standing in a stream of Marxism. They didn't think that they were doing anything different than like what Karl Marx had done, they were just taking the ideas further. So Jacques Derrida, one of the French deconstructionists, uh, Michel Foucault, another French deconstructionist, deconstructed things like meaning and knowledge. Let me, let me share with you how this is done, and I'll give you some examples. So Jacques Derrida believed that meaning was not found in what was said, but what was meant in accordance with what he called the hegemony of language. Using certain tools of analysis, many of which were inspired by Marx, Derrida endeavored to deconstruct messages in order to expose the prejudice embedded within them. So Derrida would look at, at, at a message. Think about a message uh, that, that you might hear. Um, oh, I don't know. Um, ha, have you ever done something like this? Have you ever called someone a, a woman? Have you ever maybe used a feminine pronoun? Have you ever said she? You guys are looking at me all blank stared. Yeah, of course you have, right? You ever said he or called someone a man? You're a bunch of oppressors if that's what you've done, right? Because what Derrida is saying is that language is not objectively rooted in reality. There's no actual bedrock truth that language is trying to correspond to and describe. Actually, language is just a tool that different social groups use to oppress one another. That's all it is. So if you look at the world and you see gender binary, you see there's men and there's women, and you start categorizing people according to that when they don't want to be categorized that way, you're an oppressor. You're imposing your values on them. and You don't have the right to do that. So um, Michel Foucault deconstructed knowledge by making it dependent on power. So basically, every single knowledge statement that you receive is just, uh, it, it, it's just a social group trying to exert power. If, if we had, let's say, to give you an example, an accident out here or a... Um, Let's say a police shooting happened out here, and some witnesses came in, and, uh, and they told us what had happened. And we got two different stories. The police is wrong in one story. The police is right in the other story. Michel Foucault wouldn't push you to figure out, well, who's actually objectively correct in this scenario necessarily. He would more want to examine, well, whose story is going to benefit those in power? So if the story is that the cop, uh, that the police officer, was in the wrong, well, that might be the just thing to go with because it's benefiting a, a, a group that's oppressed and it's bad for those in power who need to be cut down a few notches. So if knowledge is just connected with power, there really is no knowledge anymore. If meaning is, is just connected with this hegemony of language, there's really no meaning anymore. And that's what the postmodernists have given us. And they knew what they were doing was as... Jacques Derrida said, a radicalization of a certain Marxism. 
So this is just Marxism applied to things like meaning and language. That brings us to critical race theory. Critical race theory was developed by a Harvard professor named Derek Bell, who believed that progress in American race relations was largely a mirage, obscuring the fact that whites continue, consciously or unconsciously, to do all in their power to ensure their dominion and maintain control. There's really two basic tenets. Uh, now, there's, we could expand that, and I could give you the seven teachings of critical race theory, but they all really break down into the, these two things. That racism is systemically embedded within the fabric of society, and that it can only be addressed by interpreting the world through the lens of minority experience. So if you're not a minority with an experience, then you need to just sit down and shut up. You have nothing to add to the conversation. You don't understand injustice because you haven't lived, you don't have the experience of injustice. And what does that do with our word of God, ultimately? It negates it. No longer is the word of God the authority on dealing with issues of injustice. It's, we have to go to survivors of sexual abuse. We have to go to uh, the, the victims of police brutality. We have to find in their stories solutions to these things. And I would submit that that's happening, and I'll give you some examples in the next session, all over the place in Christianity today. Now, one of uh, Bell's students, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, developed something called intersectionality. And she believed that um, identity politics, politics had failed, and, so, uh, and the reason was because we all have uh, different identity factors. And some people have multiple identity factors that uh, signal oppression. So you could be, let's see, female, and you could be a minority, and you could be gluten-free, and you could be an introvert, uh, I'm just or left-handed or something. I mean, it, it gets kind of silly after a while. And all of these things end up making you authoritative, more authoritative, to speak about oppression. So there's a race to the bottom today. Everyone wants to be oppressed. Uh, people who you know, have grown up with a silver spoon in their mouth are saying how oppressed they are because uh, you know, they're... Their riches are somehow uh, factors that stress them out and oppress them. And, and so intersectionality has, instead of pursuing excell excellence, has created in our society, like I said, a race to the bottom. Now, the goal of all of this, and this is really the meat of what I want to share with you, is to destroy Orthodox Christianity. Karl Marx said that the social principles of Christianity preach the necessity of a ruling and oppressed class. He was against Christianity. Um, Antonio Gramsci wanted socialism to, quote, kill Christianity. Michel Foucault, Foucault uh, wanted to liberate people from political rationality, which he believed stood on the idea of Christian pastoral power. But it wasn't enough to eliminate Christianity. The actual end game of this was to replace Orthodox Christianity with something else. Rousseau believed that Christian law was harmful, but he imagined a religion that would one day make a revolution among men based on the innate principles of justice and virtue in people, humanistic. H.G. Wells, if you ever read The Time Machine uh, or um, some of his other, War of the Worlds, I actually like H.G. Wells, and I found out he was this atheist Fabian socialist, and uh, I still like H.G. Wells, but uh, it made me look at his stuff a little differently. He said in a book called The Open Conspiracy that he wanted to replace religious, familial, and national loyalties. And with, and what did he want to replace them with? He said, a world religion. This is an atheist saying this. He renamed the Open Conspiracy in a 1940 book, and instead of calling it the Open Conspiracy, he called it, and this is not my term, the New World Order. That was his term. Derek Bell believed that fundamentalist Christians uh, were in the wrong for diverting political protest and reaffirming the conservative values on which the white middle classes, traditional illusions of superiority are grounded, but he also thought there's a new interpret of, uh, interpretation of Christianity that could lead to enlightenment and pacification. In 2020, we saw on the streets what Michael Tracy, a secular reporter, called revival services, basically. He said that, I'm telling you, every protest I've been to so far perfectly mirrors an outdoor evangelical Christian worship service. Kneeling down for a certain amount of time, um, I mean, you, you have probably all the images in your head. This was, this was worship going on. This was religion that we were seeing. In fact, I, I remember one of, um, one of my wife's friends on, on Facebook, a, a, sort of an ex-evangelical, said that that was her church now, was going to these protests. 
What we've seen develop before our eyes is a brand new religion. The bad news isn't original sin that we all have, a divine law that condemns us, judgment that's coming. The bad news is now you have whiteness, maleness, and heterosexuality. You need to follow political correctness, and you haven't. And the judgment is getting canceled in this life. Instead of the good news that you can be born again in Jesus Christ, that you can be sanctified in him, that you can one day be with him in heaven, the good news is you can become woke. That's their born-again experience. You can take progressive political action. You can have social equity, inclusion, and diversity on this world maybe one day. They have their own canon, woke books that cannot be questioned, their own inspired, oppressed perspectives. Uh, They have their own clergy, priests, prophets, media, social studies programs, critical theorists, community organizers. They have their own evangelism and missions, decolonization, implicit bias training at your jobs. They have their own saints, the victims of police shootings. In fact, I think with COVID, we've seen similar, uh, a, a similar development here. Um, salvation is vaccination. Sacraments, masks, social distancing, lockdowns, booster shots, proselytizing, public service announcements, social media virtue signals, membership in the religion, your vaccine card. The heathens, the unvaccinated, The heretics, the anti-vax conspiracy theorists, the high priests, Anthony Fauci and government health officials. God is government and the Savior is science. This is a religion. And we're seeing different iterations of it, but in every single case, the central authority, the government, ends up somehow being the one that we have to cry out to, to solve our dilemma. It becomes God. Let me give you the definition of social justice again. The modern social justice movement is a repackaged configuration of egalitarian ideas heavily influenced over the past century by postmodern and Marxist derivatives. Its purpose is to rectify disparities in advantages between social groups through reallocation. The goals are achieving an egalitarian ideal, dismantling social institutions that prevent its achievement, and implementing a force capable of executing this utopian dream. If you understand that, you'll be able to recognize it even if it changes forms, even if it's repackaged, you'll you'll see those fundamental characteristics. Now, the Apostle Paul said in Colossians 2.8, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. That's exactly what's happened with the social justice movement. It's not just stayed out there. It's not just something that we experience at our jobs or when we're shopping or uh, we we use a streaming service. I I think in 2020, I was getting emails from companies I hadn't frequented in like 15 years. I didn't even know they had my email saying how much they were against racism, systemic racism. I mean, it's everywhere out there. That's bad enough, but it's in here too. And I want to point out some things that should concern us about the syncretization, the merging of social justice and Christianity. In order to do that, I'm going to need to take you through the three main uh, philosophical branches and compare what Christianity says and then what social justice teaches. So we're going to talk about, these are kind of big words. Uh, Some of you might not have heard of them, but I'll explain them. We're going to talk about metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. Metaphysics is uh, the study of what exists, what's in reality, what kinds of things are out there, what is reality composed of. Uh, epistemology is uh, concerned with questions of how do we know what truth is? What is truth? And then ethics is right and wrong. It's, you know, we think of it as morality, um, but it, there's more than that. There's the, the beauty, there's, there's value theory. So in these three philosophical branches, what we see in social justice is um, concepts called, uh, in metaphysics, they have their own ideology, and I'll define that in a minute. They have standpoint epistemology, for their uh, way of figuring out what truth is. And then they have egalitarianism, which we've talked about, equity, diversity, and inclusion, uh, for their ethics. In each case, these particular teachings actually all mirror ancient heresies. They mirror Gnosticism, Gnostic dualism, Pelagianism, Marcionism, Pharisaism, and, of course, the Galatian heresy. Now, I don't have time to get into all of those with you, but I want to give you what I think are the the most important pieces of this puzzle for when you talk to friends who might be involved in this or you're just trying to 
hedge against these ideas coming into your church for the sake of discernment. There are many books today advocating a merging of these two different religions. Uh, just to name a few, Removing the Stain of Racism from the Southern Baptist Convention, Woke Church, Jesus and John Wayne, The Color of Compromise, Be the Bridge. All of these books merge uh, social justice concepts with Christianity. Now let's talk about the first philosophical um, school of thought here, metaphysics. And social justice presents us with something called ideology. Let me give you a definition for that. Historian Kerry Roberts describes ideology as a rationalistic, closed system of thought designed to explain all of human behavior through simple precepts. So all of human behavior, everything a human can possibly do, everything you can think, everything you can do, is explained or fit into this narrow channel of evaluation. Ideology explains human nature and activity in total by reducing it to one singular impulse. Now, for Marxists, that's class conflict. It motivates everything. Everything that happens is motivated by this engine of class conflict. You're just wanting to benefit your class. For feminists, it's patriarchal domination. Everything is toxic masculinity. Uh, and and that's, that's how they see the world. They can see it in places that we would never see it. But they'll say that was, that was a toxic thing that just happened. For critical race theorists, it is whiteness. I mean, they can find it on the McDonald's menu. You're like, there's cheeseburger. That's, how's that racist? What? But they, they and I have articles in, in the book in the back, the red one, serious articles in mainstream, more progressive leaning, but news organizations claiming that things like beards, kid you not, beards, um, farmer's markets, and sheet note music are all racist. These are people that have PhDs saying these kinds of things. These aren't a bunch of ignoramus social justice warriors who haven't thought through it. And they have their reasons for it. You know, like for beards, it's like, well, you know, black people used to cut hair. It's like, it's, I mean, they'll have a long article about this. And you're like, okay. But this is what ideology does. And the effects of seeing the world in these simplistic terms means that trust is destroyed because you presume guilt on any human activity not advancing egalitarianism. If you're not down with the struggle, silence is violence. You must be a horrible racist person. It also requires immediate, drastic, and often forceful solutions to social problems. So this is where cancel culture comes in, um, that uh, corporate exercises and shaming, they, they reflect a singular and universal approach to negative situations, that there's a one-size-fits-all, we're always in a battlefield war kind of posture because there's this looming threat that's everywhere out there of racism or sexism or something, and we just got to take our sword and whack it every time we see it. Who cares about the consequences of what that might mean? And so it reorients the purpose of life towards political activism. And if you're not doing something, if you're not politically active for this agenda, then, uh, then, then you're essentially on the other side. And this is, I think, one of the reasons that a lot of families have, have had so much division when they send their kids off to college and they come back as social justice warriors. They, don't, they think mom and dad are horrible now, even though mom and dad paid for their education, because mom and dad aren't activists like we are. So how do we respond as Christians? And what does Christianity propose? What, how does Christianity differ from this? Well, radically different. Christianity has a much broader way of looking at reality. It's not just this narrow channel of evaluation, these simple precepts that, um, I'll give you an example. If, if you've ever seen this movie, I'm not recommending it, but there's a movie called The Matrix, okay? And in, in that movie, the whole premise is you, you have someone who's, um, who's asleep, but well, their, their mind is being controlled, they fed the stimuli from robots and from, from technology. And it looks real to them, but it's not. So they have this kind of like overlaid reality, but it's, it's only ones and zeros. It's just this simple thing. It's just ones and zeros. That's how a social justice warrior looks at the world. Everything's just one and zero. It's like, well, it's, it's either oppress, oppression or it's uh, someone who is oppressed. That, I mean, it's, it's just those are the two options. And so something has to fall on one side of this divide. Christianity, though, looks at the world and sees something much more, not just complex, but robust, life-giving, um, and real. There's ways in which people are similar. We're all made in the image of God, Genesis 1. We're accountable to God. Acts 17 says that. We're subject to his law, as Exodus 12 says. We're sinful. We have all fallen short of God's glory. We need salvation. 
And if we're redeemed, we're part of the body of Christ. These are ways in which we're all similar. Guess what? That can be, that can be used as glue to see commonalities in each other and build trust among each other. Social justice can only arouse mistrust. There's also ways in which we're different, though. We have different genders. God made them male and female. We have a different culture, different geography, where we live, a uh, different race. Um, Acts 17 talks about this. We have also different abilities. Uh, you can do things I can't do. I can do things you can't do. We have different spiritual gifts, and we have different hierarchical positions. Ephesians 5, Romans 13 talks about wives, subjects, children's parents, masters, slaves, rulers, uh, subjects. So you have all these different relationships that exist, some of them uh, rooted in creation, some of them just part of the social fabric we live in, and guess what? They make you who you are, and it's a beautiful thing. God put you here for such a time as this, and he made you exactly who you are, and he wanted you exactly where he put you, and he didn't make a mistake when he made you. That's a comforting thought. Social justice has none of that. There's no redemption in social justice. You, if, you're, I mean, if you're born as a, God forbid, a, a white Christian male, my goodness, you're going to have to bear that weight for the rest of your life because that's the oppressor categories according to the sociologists. So that's what Christianity teaches in contrast to social justice and how it operates. Now, um, one of the things, and, and this is just a more of a logical critique, and I'll give you some biblical, but one of the things that I think is important to think through, and it, you have to take an intellectual step back with me for a moment, is when ideologues, when social justice warriors impress upon reality this framework that they've developed, they don't apply it to themselves. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that happens a lot with progressives? They don't apply what they want to preach to others to themselves. Do you know the most conservative uh, states in this country are the most generous? Mississippi, one of the most impoverished states, is either one or two as far as giving most to charity. It's not Massachusetts or California. I mean, it's just interesting to me. That's a tendency that I see a lot. In this particular case, though, social justice activists don't connect their, um, their ideology to oppression. If everything, so here's the thing. If everything's connected to oppression out there, why not the idea that everything's connected to oppression? Maybe that's oppression. Maybe the very idea that everything's connected to oppression is oppression. Now that'll, I don't know, take two Advil and then it makes sense and then you kind of lose it. it. When social justice warriors, though, go out and rage against the machine or the system, what about the little system in here? Is there something in here that might be oppression? Now, Christianity teaches there's evil in the heart. Social justice activists don't believe that. It's all out there. It's systemic. It's, uh, the source of evil is all out there. So that's a, an Achilles heel. That's a self-refutation of the ideological position. Um, I think good questions to ask social justice activists. What tangible things are social justice activists personally involved in doing to help the condition of suffering people? You know, is it just this systemic thing, or are you involved? Are you, are you involved in charity? Are you doing things? Um, how about um, uh, the, the Bible's, uh, I'm thinking of like a, Exodus 20, 16, injunction to not bear false witness. Uh, or Proverbs 20, 10, which says not to use differing weights and measures, that the Lord hates those kinds of things. That's, that's what social justice warriors do when they engage in this kind of ideology. Proverbs 18, 2 says, a fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. And so this is where I would put the brakes on and say, if someone who wants to view the world that way is, have you thought through it? Have you, the people you're trying to smear, have you really, are you looking at them uh, through a flash moment of their life and trying to just reduce them down to being uh, um, characterized, defined by that one moment? Or are you looking through the full scope of what God created them to be? All their identity factors, um, all the, the, the things that make life rich. I'm going to talk now just for the sake of time because I'm going a little over in a few minutes here. Um, I want to skip ahead to standpoint epistemology the way that the Bible conceives of truth and the way social justice activists conceive of truth. Standpoint epistemology is the idea that um, different experiences produce different kinds of understandings of reality. And so standpoint theorists consider oppressed experiences to be superior to experiences that don't have oppression. Let me, let me paint a picture for you. So you have two boxes, let's say, in a 3D stick world. You have red box and blue box, and inside red box lives red man, and blue box lives blue man. Just 
imagine with me for a second. And they both have glasses, red glasses and blue glasses. And for the red guy stuck in his red box, everything looks red. For the blue guy stuck in his blue box, everything looks blue. And so they can have no interaction between the, themselves because they're stuck in their box. And reality looks one way to one person. Reality looks another way to another person. That's the world that postmodernists really give us. We're all stuck in our perspectives. We can't transcend those things. We're all just kind of stuck here. I'm a white male. I'm going to have a white male perspective and nothing else. Okay? I, I, and I just have to listen to these outside perspectives because I'm, I'm incapable of thinking for myself. Now, the sociologists, this is the sneaky part. Sociologists or critical theorists are able somehow to transcend this. They don't tell you that, but they have a God view. They can look at the red and they can look at blue and they can transcend it and say, you know what? I think red has the truth and blue doesn't. We should all listen to red. Red has a, a more accurate understanding of what's really taking place. And so they create a hierarchy. Now, they'll never say this because they don't like hierarchy, but they're, they actually prefer red over blue, let's say, in this scenario. Let's say blue wants to fund the police and red wants to defund the police. And the sociologists come along and say, well, red's more oppressed. Red, red is, is the honest one because of that, and so we need to defund the police. The reality is, in that case, the sociologist has put themselves in a position of not being in a box. How come they're not in the box like all of us? How come we are all constrained by our social location and can't rise above it, but the sociologist can compare all of these different social locations and then tell us which one is actually producing truth? That makes no sense. But it's because they're putting themselves in the place of God. According to Scripture, we have a God view. God actually sees all. He knows everything that takes place. Even the information that we don't have about a crime, he sees what happened. And God doesn't want the blue person to put on red person's glasses. God wants us all, no matter who we are, to put on his glasses. And guess how we do that? Well, he gave us natural revelation. He gave us the five senses. So we can see the world. He also gave us special revelation, didn't he? He gave us his word. And what we see in Scripture, instead of simply believe women because they're women, or uh, you know, someone who's the victim of a, a school shooting, we've got to get their advice on gun legislation because they were a victim, even though they're like 16. Or uh, we don't see, you know, just because someone's a, a racial minority, then they must be listened to because of that. What we see instead is that it's the man of God who rightly divides the word of truth, who knows the truth. Throughout Proverbs, we see this principle that it's those who actually pursue wisdom who are wise. It's the Bereans who checked Paul out and did the hard work of looking at what he said compared to what the Scripture said who were commended. The emphasis in Scripture isn't on your social location. There's no barrier there to understanding the truth that God has given us. The emphasis is your attitude. Are you going to be humble? Are you going to be wise? Are you going to pursue God's law or are you going to run away from it? It's those who have sought to live a holy life according to God's law, that we ought to be getting perspectives from about justice. Not someone who just happens to be, uh, have a certain uh, ethnic identity or um, gender identity or something like that. And in fact, objective truth is presented as just, it's just assumed in Scripture all over the place. Uh, just looking at the Gospel of John, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit, and what? Truth. You will know what? The truth, and the truth will make you free. Jesus said, on the way, the truth in the life. Truth is very important. And if you give that up and just say, well, there's really no truth, it's just different competing social groups trying to get their story told, then you've given up the Bible. That's why this is so dangerous. And that's why I'm very concerned when I see this being imported into the church. And uh, it is being imported all over the place. And we, we'll talk about some of that in the next session. Some questions to ask. Um, here, here's one. Would we assume someone is qualified to write instruction manuals for surgeons simply because they underwent an operation? That would be silly, wouldn't it? And you would probably want to say, forget it, I'm putting my clothes back on, we're leaving here, if the person who was going to do your brain surgery said, well, I had a surgery once, so I'm qualified to do this. But that's essentially what we're being asked to believe. Now, the third thing, uh, and, and I, I realize I'm a little over, is that okay? <laughs> I can save it for the next session is egalitarianism, equality, diverse, or, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Let me give you a definition uh, from Treasury Secretary Leslie Shaw 
uh, on socialism. I think it's one of the best definitions of socialism I've ever heard. This is what he said. Socialism is the idea that men must succeed equally regardless of aptitude. They must succeed equally regardless of aptitude. So, that means if there's a disparity between people groups, one pe- uh, group of people has stuff, one group of people doesn't have stuff, or access to health care, not a- education, whatever it is, then that's fundamentally wrong in the mind of a socialist. And whether or not choices were made that brought about a state of affairs that led to this bad situation is irrelevant. It must be rectified. And the only way it can be rectified is through redistribution. You've got to take from one group and give to another. That's the only way. There's no other way. Now, this isn't just happening with, in, in money and you know, finances. It's not just reparations and things like that. It's diversifying theological libraries and elder boards. The whole idea behind that is it's not fair that certain people, even though Scripture only gives us one standard, right? In Titus, it tells us what the qualifications are. We, that's not enough for social justice activists. We've got to implement another standard. We've got to make sure the elder board's diverse. Because if it's not diverse, then yeah, that's like racist or something. And the whole, idea, that, that the whole idea behind that is there must be, everyone must succeed equally. We must have equal platforming, equal privilege, equal access to finances. And the, every single issue on the left is pretty much forwarding this egalitarian agenda. Every single one. I, have, I, I thought about this for a while. I couldn't think of one that wasn't. Whether it's positive rights, preferred pronouns, hate speech laws, global... I could just get, run through a whole list. Every single thing. Even the, the issues being argued about with Roe v. Wade right now, it's all about that. That's the only argument they keep using. And so it's a powerful argument because it appeals to our sense of justice but it's a twisted justice. Real justice, biblical justice, is seen all over the world outside courtrooms in statues of Lady Justice where she has a blindfold on. Have you ever seen that? You know, the Supreme Court, right in front, on the, as you're looking at the left side, there's a statue of Lady Justice with a blindfold on. And the reason for that is because Lady Justice ought to be neutral when it comes to the people walking into the courtroom. If someone walks into the courtroom and it's your brother, doesn't matter. You apply the law. In fact, you recuse yourself, but it doesn't matter if it's someone you like or don't like. You apply the law to them, and if they're owed something, you give them whatever they're owed. If they uh, committed a crime, then you apply the punishment, and you do so without partiality, and that's what justice is biblically. Exodus 23 is the go-to passage in my mind for this, where where God says, uh, do not be partial to a poor man in a dispute. Exodus 23.3. A poor man? Yeah, you know why? Because a poor man will pull your heartstrings, and you might kind of be softer when you shouldn't be. How about don't follow after a multitude? Uh, uh, Do not join your hand with a wicked man. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey wandering away, you shall surely return it to him. Talks about your needy brother. Don't favor your needy brother. Uh, Don't oppress a stranger, because a stranger is not going to have all the access to navigate. They won't understand uh, some of the, the laws and things that exist in your land. So, um, the whole point is that it doesn't matter who the person is, treat people impartially. That's what justice is. Well, social justice is the exact opposite. It injects partiality. It says, well, when that person, when, you, when, you're, when you're seeing that person on the street, you better treat them differently because they have a certain skin color or they're a certain gender. And, and so you end up adjusting the way you treat other people. And if that gets embedded into our criminal justice system, which is the whole point of critical race theory, we don't have a justice system anymore. And it's already starting. So questions to ask people who believe this, egalitarianism. Um, one of them, is God's law just? If they're a Christian, is God's law just? Because it doesn't say any of this. Um, does, uh, w- one of the questions is, on what basis are humans entitled to social privileges? So what, what gives someone the right to something else, fundamentally? That's hardly ever thought through. It's just assumed because of a disparity. Are there certain hierarchies that should not be deconstructed? How about the family? The family produces disparate social outcomes. People with moms and dads do better. Should we just eliminate moms and dads? Like, how far do we take this thinking? So that's the third major area in which Christianity and social justice conflict. And then the last and final, and I'm wrapping it up, area that concerns me the most is social justice ultimately is a different gospel. 
For social justice activists, human participation in achieving egalitarian equality is good news. It means the world will eventually overcome inequalities through corporate human action and enter a utopian state. Social justice activists within Christianity often merge the gospel's message of salvation by grace through faith with a law derived from principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Such fusion merges elements of the law with the gospel. I could give you quote after quote, and they're in, they're in the red book back there, of Christians in the Southern Baptist Convention, in the PCA, in all kinds of evangelical places, making this exact argument. How about I give you one? just for the sake of time. Let me just give you one. And um, I'll, uh, I'll use Russell Moore, if that's okay. Russell Moore works for Christianity Today. He was the former head of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission for the Southern Baptist Convention. He believed that Martin Luther King Jr. preached the gospel through his activism. But Orthodox believers, meaning you and myself today, the church today, uh, failed to preach the gospel or, or to have the gospel, to be a gospel people because they did not participate, their parents and grandparents did not, not participate enough in the civil rights movement. And because of their silence today in the face of systemic sin, so, such as he, and he talks about poor working conditions uh, and shootings of African-American young men and the segregation, he says, that exists in the church. So because you go to a church, let's say, that isn't diverse ethnically, you don't really have the gospel. That's the insinuation. And I can give you quote after quote after quote. Uh, Eric Mason, the author of Woke Church, thinks that the church ought to look to secular institutions like South Africa's Reconciliation Committee or Germany's denazification program in order to know how to apply the gospel. They're not even Christians. But now we get into a weird spot where non-Christians in the world somehow have part of the gospel. I hear the term often, you only have a half gospel if you believe in individual salvation or a partial gospel or an incomplete gospel. Briefly, what is the gospel? The gospel is the power of God is for salvation to everyone who believes. Romans 1, 16. Galatians 2 says, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. What is the gospel? The gospel means good news. The book of Galatians, Paul was very concerned that a false gospel, a false good news had entered the church. And it was the Judaizers who were bringing it. And what they said was, it's great that you have the gospel, but you get, guess what? You've got to be circumcised too. Then you really have the gospel. That's, that's the true gospel is, is salvation by grace through faith and they added to it, circumcision. That's what the social justice activists are doing today. It's great that you have that, but you also need to do these social justice works. You need to be, get involved in activism. Then you have the full gospel. Paul could not have been stronger in his treatment of this different gospel. He said that anyone, if anyone comes to you with another gospel, he is to be accursed, an anthema. And if anyone doesn't have a different gospel but actually runs cover for people who do, like Peter was doing, they are guilty, he said, and they should be publicly confronted. And there's very little of that happening today in the church. So mixing law and grace is probably the biggest issue I have with the social justice movement, and it's what inspires me to talk about it. What does Christianity offer, though? Here's, here's the glimmer of hope here at the end here. What does Christianity offer in contrast to social justice? Well, number one, forgiveness of sins, real forgiveness. You're not on the hamster wheel forever trying to figure out how to prove that you're not racist or something. There's a one time for all, Jesus died, he paid for your sin. There's unity in Christ. Uh, and that's among gender, class, age, tribe, tongue, nation. There's a unity when you're in him. There's a fulfilling identity because you realize I'm more than just a power relationship. I'm more than just an oppressor or an oppressed person. Man, I like to golf. <laughs> I'm also in Christ. I, there's certain foods I like. There's a place I came from. There's, there's all these things that make you you. And it, you don't just get reduced to this singular impulse. There's roles and responsibilities. So you have a purpose in life. And then there's a basis for rights linked to responsibilities we have before God. You know why the government can't tell me what to do with my children? Because it's not up to them. God gave me that responsibility. You know why the government shouldn't be able to tell the church what to do? Because the church has a specific responsibility and role given to it by God. So there's, there's, there's lanes, there's roles, there's, respons there's responsibilities, there's order. 
And there's also a sense of belonging in Christianity, a theology of culture, that we know where culture came from. We know God is the one who produced your story. He's the one that brought you to the point in which you live today. And it's a beautiful story. And there's a lot of winds and twists and bends and bad things that happened along the way. But you can look back at that and you can say, look what God did. Look where I am. And look, you're sitting here in church. He, he brought you the message of salvation. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. One of the things, and I'll, I'll just say this uh, at the end here, is I have been very blessed to be involved with campus ministry for the last, I guess, 15 years now. And I've noticed that people coming into college frequently come from broken homes. They are looking for something, some kind of an identity. They're looking for a place to belong. And because they've moved around the country three times or four times or ten times and they, their, their parents hate each other and they, they've never seen what a good relationship looks like, they're ripe for the social justice movement because it gives you a sense of purpose. Like, we're going to go and we're going to really rectify things. And I get to be part of it. But when Christians can be involved with people who, who have these, uh, come from these uh, situations, it makes a huge world of difference. Because they're looking for that. They're looking for a place to belong. A place. They're looking for uh, th- th- what real love is. They haven't seen it. And so that's when, when people ask me, what can I do? That's one of the things that I often say is, where can you get involved in the lives of younger people? And what kind of example can you show them? And I think that goes a long way. So um, that's the, the presentation on social justice and what it is and why it contradicts Christianity. There's a lot more that can be said. And I've... Uh, I've gone way over, but um, there's some books in the back if you're interested, and uh, I guess we're having a Q&A, and then I'll be here afterward if you have any more questions. So.